Hello everyone, my name is Preston Dennett, and welcome to a new episode of UFOs and the Paranormal. Today I'd like to talk about one of my favorite aspects of ufology, and that, of course, is humanoids. And that's the title of this episode, The Humanoids. Twelve Cases of Face-to-Face -face Contact with Extraterrestrials. I love these cases because, as I've said many times, there's very little chance of misperception because these encounters are so close. I also like them because they really have the potential to answer a lot of the questions surrounding UFO contact, what it's like to have contact with the ETs, why the ETs are here, the different types of ETs, and so forth. So these cases come from all over the world, across Europe, Canada, the United States, and reach back through time all the way to the 1930s up to the 1990s. And what I like about these cases is they're all different, each involving different types of humanoids. There's a huge variety of humanoids. It's super fascinating. And we definitely see that in this collection of cases. Some are quite brief, so I was able to squeeze in 12 cases, but some are pretty extensive, and all, I think, are super interesting. And they do, of course, contain evidence of the kinds we often see, which is animal reactions, some interesting landing traces, medical effects, electromagnetic disturbances as well. So with 12 cases, that's a lot to cover. Let's just get started. And the first case I'd like to talk about, I call the ETs on the platform. And this took place on July 25, 1938 in Guadalajara, Spain. This is an interesting case, not only because it's a very early in time, but it's quite an unusual shape of a UFO. What it did is very unusual. And it also took place at a time when the country was being torn by a civil war. So that itself is pretty interesting. Again, at the time of this encounter, Spain was in the middle of a bad civil war. But it was around 11.15 p.m. on July 25, 1938, when a lieutenant and his aide were descending down a gully in the town of La Alcaria. Again, this is in Guadalajara, Spain. Suddenly, a brilliant white light shone down from above. It went out moments later, but looking at the source of the light, the two witnesses saw a disc-shaped object, which they estimated was about 33 feet wide and 15 feet tall. It was pretty close, about 180 feet away from them, and it hovered only 6 feet above the ground. They said it looked like, quote, two plates joined on their convex sides, separated by a line or section of a darker color. Now, as they watched, a column with a small platform extended down from the lower section, and on the platform were two humanoid figures. Now, after this column carrying the figures came down, the object shone down a blue light on the ground. And when the light hit the witnesses, they said that they could feel this strange sensation of coldness. The disc itself seemed to be surrounded by colored sparks. After a few moments, the light switched off. The platform in the column retracted back into the craft. Then, the two halves of the craft appeared to rotate in opposite directions. And at the same time, the disc glowed with a white light and shot upwards into the sky and was gone. At the time, the witnesses did not think that this was a UFO or extraterrestrial craft. They assumed it was a secret Russian military craft, which it may have been, I don't know. Uh, but later on, they did believe that this was probably extraterrestrial or a classic UFO. It's interesting to me that in that case, the witnesses did not even really consider the possibility that this was extraterrestrial. Of course, not until much later. But it certainly looks like that was an extraterrestrial craft and perhaps investigating why humans were being so violent to each other. That's pure speculation, of course. I don't know. But given that this is a warning that so many contactees get, I think it's a definite possibility.
But let's move on to the next case, and I love this one. It's very poignant, involving a very young witness who had a face-to-face -face encounter with a really unusual humanoid. And I call this one The Crouching Alien. This took place on September 2nd, 1954, on a farm in Coldwater, Kansas. And I love this case because the main witness got a very close-up look at this ET. It also involves some really compelling evidence in terms of landing traces as well. The sun was setting and was about quitting time early in the evening of September 2nd, 1954, as 12 year old John Jacob Swaim finished plowing the farm's wheat field with the family's tractor. Now, this field was terraced, this is an important detail. And John was just getting ready to go into the house when he saw something unusual peeking over the ridge of one of the terraces. So he went closer to go see, and whatever it was, moved behind another terrace. So John crept closer and then got a huge shock as he saw a three-foot-tall little man crouching down and looking right at him. John said that this little guy had dark skin, as he says, quote, pretty dark complexioned, and he was dressed in a jumpsuit, which John said was, quote, sort of shiny. And on his back, he had two foot-long shiny cylinders kind of strapped to his back. And according to John, it looked like he had little flippers for shoes on his feet. And as John says, describing what happened, I was on the tractor disking. Suddenly I saw him, about 20 feet away. He stood right there, a little fellow, about the size of a five-year-old child. He had long pointed ears and a pointed nose. He was sort of crouching, looking at me. Then he ran, or maybe he flew, to the saucer. I hadn't seen the saucer until then. It was hanging about five feet from the ground. The little man jumped in a door, and the saucer took off. It went awfully fast so fast that, compared to it, a jet would seem like a turtle. Now, John did get a look at the, this little guy's face and said he kind of looked, as he said, mean. And he said its hands, quote, looked just like anyone's hands, only smaller. Now, according to John, this ship was shaped somewhat like a cucumber. He said it was about 50 feet long and had seven lights or perhaps lit portholes on it. And it was about 300 feet away from where John had first seen this little fellow. Now, later, he spoke with the Reverend, uh, Reverend Baller. And John provided more details about what he saw as John wrote to the Reverend. I came on a terrace. He was crouched behind it. He jumped up and looked at me and kind of floated. He jumped into the saucer and it took off. It went out of sight. So immediately after this encounter, John ran and told his parents, who could tell pretty quickly by John's excitement that he was telling the truth. So they called the local sheriff, Sheriff Floyd Hadley, who came to investigate. And John told the sheriff everything he saw and then said that after he saw the little man, he, quote, went home. I never knew a fellow could get over those terraces so fast. So they went out to investigate in the field, and this is when Sheriff Hadley found lots of small footprints. And he said a few of them were perfectly defined. And as Sheriff Hadley says in his own words, there were 100 of them around in a circle where John Jacob said the little man climbed aboard the saucer. There were four tracks where the boy first saw the little man, but none between the two sets of prints which were about 30 yards apart. So this lends credence to John's testimony that this little man actually floated or flew. And the sheriff says he actually wrote a confidential letter to the FBI in Washington, along with the impressions of these footprints. Unfortunately, nothing is known about what happened to this evidence. But John's father also talked to the sheriff, of course, and to reporters. And John's father says, John Jacob has never been a boy to tell any tall tales. He convinced me he had seen something. So John's father, of course, examined the footprints as well. And as he says, 
They were pear-shaped, about four and a half inches long, a little less than two inches across at the toes, and with the narrowest heels I ever saw. The prints weren't those of any animal. I know all the wild prints. The impression was deepest at the toes, as if the fellow had been running, but there wasn't any great weight behind the prints. They didn't show a hard impression, more like they had been made by a soft shoe. The boy saw something. Now Robert's younger, ten-year-old brother backed up his older brother and said, quote, I know one thing. My brother saw what he saw. Though he did tell the reporters that he was kind of mad he didn't get to see the little man too and said that his big brother, quote, has all the luck. So John Jacob stuck to his story and he, he says, quote, I swear I saw him. It's a pretty interesting case. What an amazing case that is. Yes, it does have only one witness, but the family certainly backs him up. And as well, there are all those footprints and landing traces that were found. And it's certainly an unusual case, given the description of the ET. And here's another case, which is equally fascinating. I call this one the Peaceful ET. And this is a very interesting case involving an unusual humanoid, a very close interaction with the humanoid. This case occurred on in June of 1967 in Bilovar, Croatia, what we now call Yugoslavia. And this is first encounter is the most interesting, but I believe it led to several contacts. And in fact, the witness ended up writing a whole book about his experiences. So it's quite an extensive case. The witness in this case is a professor, Professor Franjo Friedel. And it all began when he decided to trim the poplar trees in his backyard, which were overgrown. And he was doing this over a period of days, trimming them. And then early one, one morning, he went out to trim them and stepped out into the woods behind his house and this is when he saw a figure wearing a green-gray suit and a helmet. And he first thought this must be a soldier. As there was an army base somewhat nearby, he had seen soldiers in the woods before. So he just continued cutting brush. And this is when he saw this same figure approaching him. And now he could see it was quite unusual. He was wearing a very unusual uniform. It was very short, about four feet tall. He said it had broad shoulders and looked strong, but did have a huge chest with kind of a womanly figure, he said. But this figure wore a dirty green uniform that to him looked a little bit like leather. He said it had a round contraption on its chest with a tube which connected to the helmet on its head. There was another similar contraption on its back, which had three tubes also connected to the helmet. And this helmet covered the entire head, much like an astronaut, but did have a visor, a faceplate. Uh, another thing Franjo noticed was that these round contraptions strapped to the being's torso seemed to shimmer with a kind of iridescent color. So as this figure approached, he was still thinking at first that it was a soldier, but then it spoke a strange word which he said sounded like hoyek. He heard a loud male voice, and at this point Franjo says he felt an almost electric current sweep through him as he realized that this figure was not human and was probably an E.T. And he said the E.T. spoke in a male sing-song voice, Peace be with you, do not be afraid and walked right up to him, stood in front of Franjo, and then said three words, which were in a foreign language, which sounded something like Blira Agi Nom, which Franjo somehow understood to mean, quote, time is short. Now, Franjo was quite shocked at all this. He was unable to respond. He says, as this being stood next to him, he felt strangely isolated in his surroundings, Everything was quiet. It was just like he and this figure, and the world faded away. This figure was only six feet away from him. And he said it spoke again. It said, 
I came to tell you that everything is all right with you. If you agree, I want to continue to contact you. Now, when this happened, Franjo said he felt a strange pressure in his head. But he did nod in affirmation, and the ET replied, Keep the secret. I will be back. And then repeated that strange word again, Hoyek. The creature then walked into the woods. Franjo stood there stunned as he saw this mirror-like silver disc rising from the bushes just a short distance away. This was clearly a craft. It had a series of round portholes on the bottom section. You could see what looked like a hole in the bottom center. It was totally silent, but he watched as it rotated, lifted up, and took off, emitting a strong gust of wind and what looked like a sort of bluish flame or exhaust. He said it made no sound again as it suddenly accelerated away, gaining altitude and moving off into the distance. So Franjo was so stunned by this, he just sat down where he stood, and it was at this point he heard a voice say telepathically in his head, We are in a safe place now, and you shall be at peace. So that was his first encounter, but apparently they continued, because Franjo ended up writing a book about his encounters called Lam Arabi. And in fact, a library in Croatia has his books, and they have a little quote about him. They say, Franjo, quote, claimed to have had encounters with extraterrestrials he called Gini, and to have spoken with them. He published articles about it in the magazines Vikend, Arena, and Arca. In the manuscript, he left his books, Discovery of Biblical Secrets, Genesis of Religions and Gini, and Cosmos According to Gini, and of course, Lam Arabi, which has two volumes. And apparently this library is still in possession of Franjo's books. I haven't read Franjo Friedel's book that he wrote about his experiences. Unfortunately, it is in another language that I cannot understand, but I sure would be interested to find out what he had to say about his contacts beyond this initial encounter that he had with this very unusual ET. What a fascinating case. And here's another one that I find equally interesting. It's quite brief, yes, but has some really interesting elements to it. I call this one Three Little Spacemen. This occurred in October 1967 in a little town called Melfort. This is in Saskatchewan, Canada, and it's quite a compelling case. It was around 9 p.m. one evening in October 1967 as Donald Marshall walked home after visiting his cousin. Again, this is in Melfort in Saskatchewan. And as he approached his home, he noticed an unusual light behind his house. And getting closer, he could see that the origin of this light was coming from a squarish window attached to an object of some kind that had apparently landed in his backyard. And looking at it, he could see that this window was quite big, about 16 feet long, he estimates, 4 feet high, and it appeared to be about 12 feet off the ground. And as he got closer, he could see it was, in fact, attached to this craft of some kind, which was much bigger. He estimates about 50 feet long. And he walked up to it to about 200 feet away, He heard no sound, but as he got close, he says, a bright spotlight came on, and this is when he saw three little, quote, spacemen coming out of this craft. He said they each wore green uniforms and some kind of green headgear. They appeared to be about the size of a 10-year-old child. He says they moved very quickly. No sooner had he seen them when they disappeared. He's not sure where they went. But as soon as they were out of view, this craft took off, first lifting up and moving off very slowly, apparently hitting some trees and then hovering over a gully before moving off. Uh, He estimates the total duration of this encounter was about 18, maybe 19 minutes, which is a quite long encounter. 
And he was still afraid that these little humanoids might be around, so he didn't really investigate, just went into the house and waited until the next morning to go outside and see if he could find any evidence. And the only evidence he could see were some broken branches off the tree in the area. But he remains absolutely convinced he saw a landed UFO and three little spacemen. And interestingly, it was about 11 months later, in September, when a family in the same town heard a high-pitched sound over their farmhouse. They later learned the next morning from their neighbor that he saw an object hovering over their house. They didn't see it. They became scared when this weird sound increased in pitch and the temperature rose so quickly in their house that they retreated into the cellar. So they later learned that another neighbor actually saw three disc-shaped objects in their area. So this is somewhat confirmation for Donald Marshall's encounter and certainly shows that something is going on in the area of Melfort in Saskatchewan, Canada. While that is a single witness case, apparently there were other encounters in that area at that time, which always brings up a level of corroboration and increases the credibility of a case, I think. And there's always another case. That's what's so amazing about this subject, is it's far more common than people realize. I've said it many times, but it bears repeating. Most people don't report their encounters. So any estimates as to how common this is, it's probably not accurate. And here's another case, very brief, also from Canada. I call this one, Hey You, Aliens. This is a pretty interesting case which took place on April 26, 1969 in Alberta, Canada. And again, quite brief, but I think worth knowing about. It was a cool, dark evening on April 26, 1969 in Calgary as David Arachuk was taking his dog Brandy for a walk near his home. And he was about halfway down the block when his dog Brandy suddenly stopped in her tracks. And looking up about 600 feet away, he, and of course his dog, observed a circular craft with three pulsating red lights on top. He said it was about 20 feet high, 30 feet in diameter. It was sort of a cream color, but looked like it had a sort of pitted surface. And he could smell this strange odor, which was he described as both sweet and bitter. But it was very strong, strong enough that David became a bit nauseous, he said. And looking at this object, he saw that between him and the object, about 300 feet from him, were two tall figures wearing dark clothing. As soon as he saw them, he saw that they were approaching the craft and they were beginning to walk around the farther end. Now at this point, he thought that they were perhaps his friends and he shouted out, Hey, you! These figures did not respond and he couldn't get any closer because his dog Brandy refused to approach. So David took his dog Brandy, who was now shivering with fear, took her back home, and he returned to the area with his stepdad. Unfortunately, by then, the craft and the beings were gone, but he did say that this strange odor still hung heavily in the air. And when they returned the next day, they could still smell this strange odor. I think that case is important because it illustrates how strong animal reactions can be. That poor dog, Brandy, certainly had a strong reaction to this encounter. I also find it interesting that this case involved very strong odors which lingered for a full day. That's unusual, but certainly not unique, and it's something important to say about this phenomena. I did a prior episode on UFO odors, so I think that's an important aspect to UFO encounters that certainly deserves more attention. And here's another super interesting case. This actually involves a number of encounters. It's quite a complex case. I call this one the Willard UFO Wave. This took place in Willard, Ohio, mostly on January 2nd, 22nd, 1971. It involves dozens of witnesses. Uh, one 
family, a couple, who had a very close encounter with this UFO and were able to see the humanoids inside it. So I think you'll find this quite interesting. Starting around 9 p.m. on the evening of January 22, 1971, the phones at the Norwalk Sheriff's Office in Huron County, Ohio, began to ring off the hook. Captain John L. Warner and Deputy Hank Tappel fielded a swarm of calls from people reporting UFOs. And in fact, two police officers, Sergeant Jim Robertson and Patrolman Harvey Callahan, were on patrol in different parts of the county when they both reported seeing a low-flying craft of some kind. Harvey Callahan was actually filling out an accident report when the UFO repeer, appeared. And he said it looked, quote, like something strange flying very low with flashing lights. Uh, it moved off. Both officers who saw this craft said it was actually being chased by military jet aircraft. And people all over the area were calling in to say that they saw it. Some of the witnesses include Dorothy Goble, who watched it with a dozen of her friends. And she said it was, quote, square-shaped like a big box, had red and yellow flashing lights at both ends, was about 200 to 300 feet above us, and seemed to circle and then went away. It either flew away or turned the lights out. She said it looked like, quote, a crazy flying school bus in the sky. So people gave different descriptions, I think based on their perspective. John Nestor was with Dorothy, and he said it could not have been a plane. It was the wrong shape and moved too slowly. Some of the witnesses said that they were so frightened by the appearance of this object, they actually refused to look at it. But the most amazing account comes from Richard Williams, age 18, and his wife Sharon, who were driving with their infant son along Niver Road towards the town of Willard. And suddenly, they saw this low-flying object coming directly towards their car. And I'll just quote Richard directly. As he says in his own words, I saw the object approaching me. It looked like a bat. The wings were wider than the plane or whatever it was. On the middle of each wing, there seemed to be an exhaust rocket engine or a jet engine. It had red and white lights on each of the wings and on the tail. I saw one light on each side of the wingspan. After blinking my lights at it, it stopped and hovered down a little closer. I could just about see the outline as my lights were on bright. It looked like an airplane, except it was really huge. It was really huge. It was bigger than any army hovercraft. Now, to his shock, this object stopped directly over his car, no higher than 100 feet, he says, and now he could see that it made no noise whatsoever, and he could clearly see it wasn't any plane or experimental aircraft as he thought. And in fact, he said it was diamond-shaped, about 30 feet in diameter, and in the center he could see what looked like a glass dome. And in this dome, he could see the movement of, quote, some kind of creature. He couldn't really see any details. All he could see was a silhouette. But as Richard says, and I quote, In the back of the cockpit, there was something flashing the light on and off, like you were blocking the light. So this craft, whatever it was, hovered there for about four to five minutes and then moved off. And it was shortly later, according to Richard, jet fighters appeared and followed the path that the UFO had taken. Richard called the police, he later spoke with reporters, and he says he even submitted a two-page report to an aerospace office in Washington, D.C., saying that he had never seen anything like this before. So the Huron County Police Station said that by the night's end, they had received more than 18 separate calls on that night. After an article came out in the newspaper, a bunch more people called in. Reporters and investigators converged. They contacted local airports. They contacted Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. 
all who denied having any information about any aircraft in the area. And in fact, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base denied that any jets had been in this area, that they, these jets were not theirs. Now the sheriff captain, John Warner, who handled a bunch of these calls, talked with Richard Williams, and he said of Richard's call, The man who saw it on Niver Road and his family are pretty upset. What it was, I don't know for sure. When you get a call like that, you think, Oh, it's a drunk or a crackpot. But when so many people call, and a deputy and a highway patrolman see it too, you wonder. The man who first called Willard police was really shook. He must have seen something. It's definitely the kind of case that makes me wonder, why would the UFO come down so close over someone's car? Um, Are they showing themselves off? It certainly looks like it. So many people saw it in this town and in the neighboring areas that it seems clear the ETs, if that's what they were, wanted to be seen. Now, this next case is also very important because it shows how profoundly a person can be affected by their encounter. And in fact, I call this case, Encounter Causes Nervous Breakdown. And this is something we do see sometimes. People are really affected deeply by their encounters. This one occurred on September 9, 1972, over Glasgow, Scotland. And while there was a preliminary investigation, the reaction of the witness kind of halted the investigation. So it's quite brief, but I think still important. This case was never fully investigated for reasons that will soon become apparent. The witness is anonymous, and it was around 4.30 a.m., again on September 9, 1972, and the witness was in the suburbs of Glasgow. It's not clear whether he was driving or walking outside, but he says he saw an object hovering very low over a street. He said this object was shaped like a spinning top and had a black metal surface with lights flashing underneath. He saw rows of windows along the edge and it was inside through one of these windows that this witness saw an entity, a human looking figure with blonde hair wearing a silver suit with what looked like stripes on the arms. And he said this figure was staring out the window directly at him. Now, shortly after seeing this, the object accelerated upwards into the sky. And there was only a preliminary investigation because the witness, right after seeing this, and apparently as a result of his encounter, suffered a nervous breakdown and refused to talk any more about it. So this case illustrates why the UFO cover-up is so devastating. This poor witness really would have probably done a lot better, I think, if he had had resources, if he didn't feel like he was so alone, uh, if there wasn't a cover-up, this was a subject that could be faced more head-on and be widely accepted. But unfortunately, we're not there even today. It's one of the reasons why I do this research, because this is an important subject, and it's time people recognize that it's real. So now we move to another case, which is so interesting. I call this one the Tall Silver Man. This took place on July 10, 1975 in Yulo in Wales. This is a small little town. I like this case because it's a multiple witness case and it's got corroboration because apparently there were a number of other incidents of people who kept seeing this same figure, this tall silver suited extraterrestrial. It's a very interesting case. It was about 1 p.m. on the afternoon of July 10, 1975, as Mr. and Miss Taylor drove along the A55 road at Yulo, again in Wales. And they came around a bend in the road, and this is when they saw a man standing by the side of the road who did not look normal. First of all, he was almost seven feet tall. Second, He was wearing a bright silver full-body coverall, kind of like a diver's suit, they said, 
which covered every part of his body except his face. He did have a normal-looking face, though they wondered if he might be wearing a mask. They said this figure seemed to stare at them in kind of a strange way. When they first saw him, he was standing at the bottom of a tall embankment, sort of facing away from the road as if he had just finished climbing down this little hill. But as they approached in their car, they said this figure turned to face them and kind of watched them as they drove by. And as they passed it, they saw this figure bend down and scoop something off the ground with its left hand. Now they did see this for only a few seconds or so, but they said it was long enough that they were convinced that he was not a normal person. And they actually kept this encounter secret until about two years later, when another lady by the name of Pauline Combs reported seeing well, apparently the same figure, or certainly a similar one. She said it was a seven to eight foot tall, silver-clad figure staring into the window of her home in Milford Haven. Now, Pauline's son also saw this figure, which disappeared after a car approached. And only two weeks earlier, Pauline and her children said that they were actually chased in their car by a yellow sphere. So Mr. and Miss Taylor, who saw this silver figure standing by the side of the road, never saw any UFO. But hearing Pauline Combs' description of this silver man and how similar it was to what they saw, they wondered if they had seen the same figure. And interestingly, there are two other separate witnesses who saw what might be the same tall silver man in this same exact area. It was three years later, in July again, of 1978. A man was driving with his family and saw this very tall figure. He says about six and a half feet tall, wearing a one-piece silver suit, climbing down a hill. And like the tailors, he says he watched this figure picking up something off the ground. It was a very brief sighting, but incredibly similar to what the tailors saw. Then a few years later, in 1982, a motorcyclist said he was driving through this same city, Yulo, around midlight, midnight, and he saw a figure which he says was at least seven feet tall, maybe more, wearing a silvery, almost plastic-like spacesuit and thick boots. He said the figure seemed surprised and somewhat dismayed to have been witnessed by him and the figure fled the scene, and so did the witness. That case is so interesting because people just kept on seeing this same tall silver figure, apparently the same one. Hard to say for sure, but something clearly is going on in that area. And here is another case, which I did mention briefly in a previous episode, but I found more information and found out that it in fact does involve humanoids. And I call this one Extraterrestrials on Mount Everest. Yes, you heard me right. Mount Everest. Who knew? But apparently there's not only one encounter, but several over Mount Everest. So I'd like to cover that a bit and talk about the person who saw humanoids on Mount Everest. This is back in September 1975, I believe. And of course, takes place on Mount Everest. The first witness that I could find to UFOs in the area of Mount Everest is Frank Smythe, a well-known mountain climber. In fact, he's written 27 very, pop very popular books, and he is a legend among mountain climbers. But what few people know is that he claims to have seen a UFO on Mount Everest way back in 1933. And I'll just quote him directly because he gives a very interesting account. As Frank Smythe says in his own words, I was still some 200 feet above C6 and a considerable distance horizontally from it when chancing to glance in the direction of the north ridge, I saw two curious looking objects floating in the sky. They strongly resembled kite balloons in shape but one possessed what appeared to be squat, underdeveloped wings, 
and the other a protuberance suggestive of a beak. They hovered motionless, but seemed to pulsate, a pulsation much slower than my own heart beats, which is of interest supposing that it was an optical illusion. The two objects were very dark in color and were silhouetted sharply against the sky or possibly a background of cloud. So interested was I that I stopped to observe them. My brain appeared to be working normally and I deliberately put myself through a series of tests. First of all, I glanced away. The objects did not follow my vision, but they were still there when I looked back again. Then I looked away again and this time identified by name a number of peaks, valleys, and glaciers by way of a mental test. But when I looked back again, the objects confronted me. At this, I gave them up as a bad job. But just as I was starting to move again, a mist suddenly drifted across. Gradually they disappeared behind it, and when a minute or two later it drifted clear, exposing the whole of the north ridge once more, they had vanished as mysteriously as they came. Now you have to remember back then there was really no talk whatsoever of UFOs, so that really wasn't something he even considered at the time. But now researchers are taking a second look at his account, thinking perhaps he did see UFOs, because as it turns out, he's not the only one. Reinhold Messner is one of the world's most famous, famous and accomplished mountain climbers. And in October of 1981, he went public with his sighting of a UFO. He and his climbing partner, Doug Scott, were attempting to climb the 24,000-foot Mount Shambalong, located near Mount Everest in the Himalayas, when they saw a glowing object, quote, the size of a full moon. And as Reinhold Messner says, it was moving very slowly. It moved eastward and then went again southwest and drifted finally north into Tibet. According to Reinhold, both he and Doug Scott watched it for a full three hours until it moved off. And it was apparently also sighted by a nearby joint Polish-British expedition, though at a different time. But as Doug Scott says in his own words, it could not be a satellite because it moved in an elliptical manner. The movements of this object were irregular. We are certain these objects were flying saucers. They were dome-shaped and silver, and at night they had a blue and orange lights flashing around them. I wouldn't be surprised if the space aliens had established a kind of beachhead for exploration down in one of the most inaccessible valleys. There's no doubt in my mind that these flying saucers were reconnoitering with a purpose, and not just out joyriding, so to speak. Now this account is separate from the one he saw earlier. This was when he was actually climbing Mount Everest. And Doug Scott's first wife, Jan, had actually joined him on the Everest expedition. While she did remain at the base camp at around 17,000 feet, she says that she and everyone there all saw these UFOs the whole time they were there. She said that they would fly singly or in small groups, usually about five or seven of them. And she saw more than that. As Jan says in her own words, At first, we were frightened by their presence. But after the first day, we realized that if these beings had wanted to harm us, they would have. In the snow, we were defenseless against them. And if we never returned from our climb, people in Nepal would merely think we had fallen to our deaths. They never bothered us, but these alien ships frightened us a little because they were always there. Then, after five days of being followed, we woke up one morning to find the UFOs had vanished just as mysteriously as they had arrived. So Jan reports that she not only saw the UFOs, but once one of them swooped down low enough that she could actually see humanoids looking out the window of the UFO at her. As she says in her own words, and I quote, I very definitely saw eerie, luminous creatures 
almost liquid in their movements, in the windows of a silver craft that followed me when I took a short walk alone from our encampment that evening. It was not the effects of the terrible cold and isolation, and it wasn't snow blindness either. I found that case super interesting, and also looking into it, found that there's quite a history of supernatural events of all kinds on Mount Everest, be it Bigfoot or Yeti sightings, and also ghostly encounters with apparently deceased climbers who died on Mount Everest. So there's a whole story there that hasn't been fully covered. It's super interesting. And now we move to another case. This one is really poignant and profound, I think. Uh, I call this case the injured humanoid. This is a single witness case, but by all accounts, the witness is absolutely honest and sincere and saw something very unusual. This case took place on June 12, 1977 in Crystal Lake, Illinois, and it's one of the more unusual cases of extraterrestrial contact that I've heard in some time. On June 12, 1977, sometime after 11 p.m., on this night, I believe I had an encounter of the third kind. So writes David X in a letter to J. Allen Hynek after seeing J. Allen Hynek on the Phil Donahue show talking about close encounters. Now, on the day of the encounter, again June 12th, David had just been laid off from work. So he went to meet with his friends at a local hotel to talk about his experience of being laid off. They shared some beers and talked about it. And later, around 11 p.m., David exited the hotel and looking to his right, he got a real shock because he saw three short figures walking out of the alley. He said they were each about four feet tall, each wearing dark green one-piece suits that had a weird metallic shimmer and what looked like transparent fishbowl-like helmets over their heads. He could see them quite clearly, close enough that he could see a silver ring connecting the helmets to the jumpsuits. And as David says in his own words, the only feature on the face I could see were the eyes. They were large and white that seemed to glow. I could not see a mouth or how their throat or chin were shaped. However, I could see the top of the head. There was no hair. It looked like bare skull bone. Their fingers were shaped to a point. The hand was large in proportion to the body size. Also, the feet were large. They were thin and small in size. The only outstanding things I seem to remember now are that when they came into view, the atmosphere around me became like a big vacuum room. No sound at all. I was not scared for some reason, but I certainly was surprised, caught off guard. So David is describing what researchers call the Oz effect. This eerie silence envelops the area often when people see UFOs or ETs. Now, when he first saw these figures, he said they were about 30 to 35 feet away, but were walking towards him. He first thought perhaps they might be kids playing a trick on him, but he quickly discarded this theory as it was too late for kids to be out, and nobody knew that he was about to step out of this hotel, so it couldn't be a trick. He thought at first that these figures were coming to get him, but this was when he noticed a fourth identical figure lying on the ground, literally right in front of him. And David had the distinct impression that this being was injured or hurt in some way because it was laying on its side with its head on its chest and its knees tucked up to its body. He watched as these three beings approached and began to scoop up their fallen comrade. And in fact, at this point, David said he was only a few feet away from them, close enough to touch them if he wanted. But he did not do this. He watched as these figures picked up the fallen figure and sort of carried him and walked him back into the alley, two on one side, 
and the other right behind him. He said this fallen figure walked slowly and stooped over as though he was injured. So David, at this point, had the feeling that these beings were talking telepathically to him, telling him not to be afraid, that they were not going to harm him. And he said when they were at their closest approach, he got a good look at their hands, and it looked as though they had only three or four fingers, though he says he's not completely sure about this. He only saw them for a few moments before they walked back into the alley. Now, instead of following them, David says he ran quickly back into the hotel to tell his friends. To his disappointment, they did not believe him and actually ridiculed him. But he insists he's telling the truth. It really quite traumatized him to a certain extent. And two days later, he decided he was going to report this event to the police. But because of the reaction he got from others, he really didn't talk about it. As David says in his own words, I did tell a few people what happened. No one believed me. Some of the people laughed. So I decided not to tell any more people. But I did report what happened to the Crystal Lake police. My wife is the only person who I think might believe me. At least she says she believes me. But how would you think about such a crazy story? So yeah, this did reach J. Allen Hynek and the Center for UFO Studies, who did an investigation. And interestingly, and perhaps in confirmation of David's sighting, there was in fact a UFO sighting at Mount Vernon on that night, which is about 320 miles distant from Crystal Lake. It's unfortunate that that witness did receive ridicule from people who he thought were his friends, (laughs) still are his friends, I suppose, But this ridicule factor is one of the major forces that keeps people from sharing their encounters in a more open way. So again, we're all victims of this UFO cover-up that sooner or later has got to end. It's just not sustainable. As I've said before, you can't hide the sky. Sooner or later, the truth is going to come out. And we're seeing that. And here is another case which again speaks to how common UFO encounters are. And this one is a really important case because I think it shows one of the ET agendas, which is their concern over our use of nuclear material. I call this one Robotic Alien at Atomic Installation. And this case did get a lot of attention. You may have heard of it, but if not, you should have because... I think it's an important case for those reasons. It took place on March 17, 1978 in Risley, England. And it's got some really compelling physical evidence that goes along with it as well, as well as some peripheral corroborating evidence in terms of other witnesses seeing activity around that time. It was around 11 p.m. again on March 17, 1978, as an engineer by the name of Kenneth Edwards was driving his van along the M62 motorway adjacent to what was then an atomic energy and research installation. And looking to his right, he saw this very strange-looking silver-suited figure walking in a strange stooped fashion with its arms stretched out forward as it walked down an embankment. That posture, he says, was almost impossible to maintain while walking down an embankment. So that's kind of what caught his attention. And he did drive this route regularly. And he knew it was unusual to see anyone out there at this time of night. But it was really this figure's strange outfit and the way that it was walking that really puzzled him. So he says he came to a stop about 150 feet away from it. And he could now see that this figure was about seven feet tall. He said it was weird because it walked without bending its knees. Also, its arms seemed to be joined to its chest rather than its shoulders. It was completely silver except for the head, which was dark and round. He did see two small eyes. And this being crossed the road in front of his car at kind of an angle, moving towards him. And as it crossed the road, it came to about 30 feet in front of Ken, 
and then stopped and stood in the center of the road. And this is when Kenneth now began to feel some fear. And his fear actually increased when this figure turned its head and looked directly at him, projecting what looked like two pencil-thin beams of light from its eye holes. Now, these beams of light actually struck Ken in his van, said at this point, time seemed to stop. He felt strangely dizzy. He felt like he was paralyzed and something was pressing down on his body. And as Ken says, the pressure was tremendous. It seemed to paralyze me. I could only move my eyes. The rest of me was rigid. So he's not sure how long this confrontation landed. He estimates about a minute. But he kept thinking to himself, is this something from outer space? And what does it want with me? Finally, the figure continued walking, approaching, he says, to about 15 feet in front of his van. And then it approached the security fence by this atomic installation, raised its arms, and to Ken's astonishment, walked right through the fence as if it wasn't even there. Ken was so shaken by this encounter that he just sat there in his car, trying to collect himself for about 20 minutes. As he says, 20 minutes seems like a long time, I know, but I was petrified, and I do not want to go through that again. So Ken then drove home, and he notes he got home an hour later than he normally would have. He's not willing to say for sure that he had missing time, but he wonders about it. But upon arriving home, he quickly took a shot of whiskey and told his wife Barbara, quote, I've seen a silver man. He tried to relax and go to bed, but he was unable to sleep, and finally he told his wife, I think I'd better go to the police. Will you take me? She, of course, agreed. The police took his report, took, were very much accepting of his testimony, and then returned with him to the scene. They could not find any evidence of the UFO, or, or any UFO, or any ET but it was clear to them that something had happened. And as his wife Barbara says, he had been very badly shaken. And I don't know what to make of it. I would have to see it myself to really believe it. But he saw something strange, I know. Now there were some really strange after effects. Ken says he had trouble sleeping for several days after this encounter. He noticed his watch had stopped at 11.45 exactly. He says a few days after the encounter, he did notice three small dark marks on his fingers, kind of like a sunburn, which weren't there before. But most strange, he had an expensive radio transmitter in his car, which was now burned beyond repair. It appeared to have been subjected to a massive power surge, and he connects this to his encounter. So Ken's encounter did receive a lot of publicity. He was interviewed by several investigators. In fact, on March 23rd, not long after his encounter, he returned to the site of the encounter with one investigator. And at one point, this investigator left. Ken was now alone at the top of the embankment where he had first seen this figure when he again started to feel this strange pressure again. And boom, he saw this figure walking away from him. So this is his second sighting of the same figure in the same area. And it really quite scared him, and he fled in fear. It was 10 days later, on April 2nd, he was driving the same route again, and he felt that strange pressure once again. He quickly drove off, and since then, he has refused to drive along this route and takes the long way around. Finally, 10 days later after this, on April 12th, Ken says he was awakened by a strange buzzing noise filling the house. He opened the window and looked outside. Didn't see anything. He did notice that the buzzing sound was louder, but there was no craft or anything visible. Though, investigators later interviewed two witnesses in that area, in Risley, who said that on that night, they heard the buzzing noise and did, in fact, see a red oval object moving overhead. It's quite an amazing encounter. Unfortunately, four years following his encounter, 
Ken passed away from cancer. It's definitely the kind of case that makes you wonder. And it certainly makes me feel for the people who have these encounters, because once again, you see how profoundly it affects them. And now for our final case of this episode. I call this one Reptilians Over Electric Station. And this again betrays one of the ET agendas. They are often seen over technological installations of all kinds. And I think that's what was going on in this case, where two witnesses saw a UFO hovering very low over a large electrical plant. This case took place in the fall of 1989 or 1990. They're not exactly sure of the date. But it's a very compelling case, which took place in St. Clair, Quebec, in Canada. They saw this UFO very close up. Some very unusual looking humanoids as well. And just an interesting case all around. This final and very unusual case involves two witnesses, a couple, who one afternoon in 1989 or 1990, they're not exactly sure, but they were driving by an electrical plant in St. Clair, Quebec. Chantal, the lady, noticed it first and thought it looked kind of like a boat in the sky. Uh, her husband didn't see it, her partner, and as they continued to drive, she lost sight of it. But moments later, as they were just beginning to pass this electrical plant, they both saw this object crossing the road in front of them and going directly over the plant. And as the husband says, All of a sudden, just above the way, we saw the UFO pass very slowly over the road while we advanced. It was going to hover on top of the power plant, and then it stopped there. It was not a helicopter, no propeller, nothing. No sound. It looked like it was colored rust. It was solid. This was not a light ship. So they stopped the car and looked, and at this point, this object was only about 50 feet away. It was a weird sort of teardrop shaped with an open section like a cockpit. But to them, it looked open to the air. There was no glass or enclosure around it. And in this opening, they could see two strange figures standing, one behind another. And regarding these figures, uh, he says, quote, was not human. You could see that it was not humans who were there. The shape of the skull, the face that I saw at the distance, was reptilian. It is not as smooth as a human. It was not smooth skin. He had dark skin, was not white skin. It was the same type of reptile you see drawn in this book. So they pointed to these figures here and said it looked very similar to these. But as he says, the one behind, I remember very well that he turned his head towards us. So it was clear that these beings knew they were being observed. And as the main witness says, we clearly saw that in the front of the UFO, there were two beings there, one forward and the other right behind. Then suddenly, inside my head, it tells me, do not stay here. Go away. Go away. So they got a telepathic message from these beings that, who perhaps did not want to be observed. And in fact, the witness says he drove off in kind of a daze. And after driving about 200 feet... He felt almost as if he had woke up. And this was when he realized he had had a camera right next to him and didn't even think of using it. It's a very close-up of encounter of ETs apparently examining an electrical installation. So what a case that is. And once again, we have a witness who has a camera right next to him and doesn't even think of using it. That turns up enough times in cases like these that it makes you wonder <laughs> what is going on here. It can be very shocking to see a UFO. So I think people aren't always prepared and it's hard to look away from something that is so unusual. I mean, witnesses often say they could barely believe their own eyes. 
But yeah, they saw it very close. As I said in the beginning of this episode, there's very little chance of misperception in these cases. When you are close enough to see an ET face to face, there is no misinterpreting it. You are having a face to face encounter with a humanoid. So, that's the episode for today. Again, cases coming from all over the world, reaching back through time, continuing up to pretty much the present day. Humanoids of all different types, but always humanoids. There's an important takeaway, I think, from that alone, which shows once again we all share a common heritage, a message so many contactees have received. And again, the evidence. It always makes me kind of smile in a weird way <laughs> when people say that there's no evidence, because there is animal reactions and electromagnetic disturbances and medical effects of all kinds and landing traces and so much more. As these few cases here show, which of course are just the tip of the iceberg. So that's it for tonight. Thank you once again for watching. I truly appreciate it. And until next time, keep searching for answers, keep looking for the truth, and keep having fun. Until next time, bye now.